Welcome to Scanning and Architecture. Um, so this is going to be a lecture and um, then also a, a short kind of technical introduction in terms of um, you know, things you need to consider when you're scanning yourself. Uh, it won't be so much of a demo um, because there's already pre-recorded um, software tutorials online that you can check on the skills tree. Um, so when you go onto the skills tree, there's a whole trail called Introduction to Photogrammetry. So check that out if you're interested in actually learning about using um, uh, photogrammetry and reality capture. Today, it's a little bit more, um, you know, talking about what uh, 3D scanning and photogrammetry can do in architecture and um, sort of its, let's say, expanded uh, potentials. Uh, I'll be showing a lot of examples and case studies. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about the history and kind of where photogrammetry comes from. Um, and finally, again, sort of just, just talk kind of uh, a little bit general about, about technical principles. So uh, I am posting into the Slack right now, or into the group chat, a link to the Google Slides presentation that I'll also be sharing on the screen. So you can um, follow along with me, or you can also, um, you know, for, kind of go at your own pace or in your own, uh, uh, on your own desktop with high resolution. Um, you, can, you can also follow along on there. And I have, so most of these um, uh, images have links on them. So you can just click on an image and it'll take you to a link that will show you more information about that specific uh, project or company or you know, whatever I am presenting in there. So um, yeah, um, that's just kind of in terms of technical uh, technicalities. So uh, let me, share my screen with you so that you can you can start the presentation right away. Um, all right, so here is the Google Slides. Can everybody see pretty much black screen? Yes. Perfect. All right, so um, scanning and architecture. First, um, I want to talk uh, about you know, we, we will be mostly focusing on photogrammetry as, um, as a kind of specific technique of scanning. And uh, I'll explain why in particular photogrammetry, there's lots of different types of scanning and I'll quickly kind of mention what types of scanning are out there. Um, but photogrammetry is um, literally uh, a kind of, uh, you know, the term is a conglomeration of three Greek words, um, photos, stands for light, gramma stands for letter or drawing, and the train to measure. So photogrammetry literally means measuring with light. So it's almost like a poetic um, interpretation of, of scanning, right? Like we are, when we're doing photogrammetry, we're, we're measuring with light. So I just want to kind of leave that with you. Oh, just because I see the chat popping, uh, I want to say one thing about the chat. So whenever you have questions, if you have questions that come up while, um, while I'm talking, please just put them in the chat right away so that when uh, at the end we'll have a, a short Q&A so we can sort of, so they're kind of recorded there. And also if there's a particular project you like or find interesting, also just, you know, use the, use the chat as a tool to communicate your, your ideas and stay engaged. Um, so, uh, you know, just to give you an overview over, um, let's see, is that, Okay, the menus are visible. Okay, so how can I hide them completely? Um, can I just exit this? Um, sorry, no. Um, so there should be, a, um, I think there's a little bar here at the bottom. Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, it it I, doesn't be able to just move it around. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Is it pretty much gone? Yeah, it's not covering the image anymore. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> there's, you know, a lot, a lot of going on screen share presentation. Anyway, but just, you know, before we get into photogrammetry specifically, uh, uh, the other types of scanners are 
uh, there's basically two general types. There's contact scanners and non-contact scanners. Um, and contact scanners are actually very rarely used, but I like to include them in this presentation because they're actually were the first type of scanner that I used back in 2004 uh, at the Angewandte in Vienna, where I was literally scanning uh, an architectural model point by point by point. So this was kind of like a far arm that would uh, essentially, you know, you would you would have a pedal at the bottom and then you would register each point in space. And maybe, you know, like every every good story needs a, a myth. So maybe that's my personal myth of how I got into scanning. I didn't do it then for a really long time because there were no tools available, but this is just sort of like one type of scanning. It's not so common now that we have other options available because obviously you need to be able to touch the object and it only works at a certain scale. So it's very limited as a, as a type of scanning. Um, oh, no, it's not really, okay, sorry. Uh, the other type of scanning is laser-based 3D scanners. That one's super common in architecture. And the way it works is essentially you have a laser that shoots out um, you know, a, a laser beam and then it calculates how long it takes for that laser to hit a surface and then come back. And that's how it gets a depth reading and that's how it, how it can literally scan everything around itself. And you can imagine that's a lot of computation, but at this point we're able to you know, very basically real time understand space around us through laser scanning. The big drawback and the reason, uh, um, you know, I'm not diving into that too deeply is that it's expensive. Um, GSAP actually does have a scanner and uh, as part of the historic preservation uh, department and they, um, and you can definitely use it and we've been using it in my seminar as well. Um, uh, yeah, I should mention I'm teaching a seminar on the same topic that is uh, happening probably next spring again. Um, and, uh, uh, but the, you know, even at GSEP, the constraint is that the Mika Talf is kind of like the, the lab manager always has to be there because the, the, you know, tool is very expensive. So it's something that you can definitely do if you have a very specific project and you want to scan something very large and very complex that you can't quite get with photogrammetry. Um, but it takes a, the barrier to entry is a little bit higher. Um, then another common type are structured light scanners. So structured light scanners are um, essentially work by throwing patterned light onto objects and then uh, kind of a little bit similar to the laser scanner kind of understanding how this, uh, the change in pattern um, um, uh, on the object starts to it kind of starts to understand or calculate how the depth of that object is in relationship to the camera. So it also is a camera-based scanner, um, like photogrammetry, but works through kind of projecting light onto a thing. We have one in the Maker Lab. Um, so again, if you want to use it, you can definitely, um, uh, well, at least once we're all back in school, um, uh, you know, use it. The, um, the drawback here is, well, that you need uh, you, you need the device, you need a turning table, and you need a specific camera setup. Um, they're not very expensive, but they're very limited in scale. So they're very good if you are scanning a small specific kind of object like a dinosaur or you know a toy or a sculpture or a small model. Um, but you know very very limited in terms of size. So here we get to photogrammetry again. Uh, that one is you know, uh, uh, the one we're, we're dealing with the most here. And it's essentially a technique that relies on taking photos of an object from different angles. And as you can see from this diagram here, you have sort of these three different um, uh, angles. And let's say this is, these red dots are the object that is being photographed uh, in an abstract way. And so you can see how basically the camera, uh, you know, takes the photo and the calculation essentially it tries to find out which points are the same points in all the photos and then aligns them in three-dimensional space to find the X, Y, Z coordinate of that, of that, um, of that point. So <clears throat> it really is a mathematical translation that goes between the two-dimensional and the three-dimensional. That's why I think it's so inherently architectural. It's, you can also see, it's, you can see it as a form of drawing or as we saw earlier in the definition, it's like a form of measuring with light, right? Like a camera sort of, projects light onto a surface to, to create an image. So we're literally measuring with light with that technique. And because cameras are so widely available now, um, you know, everyone has one in their pocket, 
um, it's a very democratic technique in terms of accessibility. And uh, a lot of, there's also a lot of free software to use it or free or very, very affordable software. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that later as well. Um, and the big advantage also is that it's, uh, it works at all scales. So, you know, for a, it doesn't matter as long as you have a sharp image of something, it doesn't matter what scale that object is. It could be, you know, a tiny, tiny uh, thing on your desk or it could be a whole city. The process works exactly the same. So it's kind of scale agnostic. Um, and that, you know, for architects is very important um, accessibility and, and scale. Um, so with no matter what kind of technique you're using, there's always sort of the same type of basic steps when you're taking a scan. Um, the first one is the scanning itself. So the kind of data input, that's when you are actually creating um, the information, the, you know, the point cloud, sort of you're, 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 you're collecting information, um, but it's not necessarily yet um, a process. So, um, you know, as we've seen, collecting information happens through shooting out lasers or taking photos or um, drawing light patterns onto an object. So there's, there's always kind of like a data input and basically anything that has these three steps can be described as scanning. So scanning is not defined by a particular method or technique necessarily of data input. It's actually just defined by the fact that some kind of, some kind of data comes in. And then in the second step, that data gets processed. So uh, these data points that come in um, will be extrapolated to create a shape or kind of three-dimensional form. Um, and then also what we'll see in photogrammetry is that this uh, data points will be also used to, to create color information and texture information. So, uh, you know, that's when you kind of combine sort of image mapping with, um, uh, uh, with sort of with, with geometry. So very much how you are building something in Rhino and you would give it a texture. Um, uh, it's, it's not quite the same, but it's, it's a fairly analogous process in terms of, it is using a system called meshes. Uh, 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 rather than NURBS, which, which is what Rhino is using, but it's the same idea that it, there's a 3D object that is then getting textured, uh, uh, you know, through some kind of image map. So then once that is processed, the third step is that they are merging. So usually when you're scanning something, you're not scanning uh, everything at the same time. It's usually you're scanning like, you know, either it's because you don't have access to it all at the same time or because the scans don't all align as they should. So sometimes you would have like five different scans of the same thing. And then when you're merging in that alignment phase, you're bringing them all together into one model. Um, for example, an example that I'll show later is you could do, you can scan the exterior of a, build, of a building and scan the interior separate. And then when you're merging or aligning them, then you can bring them all together. So when you are scanning your prototypes, for example, from last week, you know, maybe you also want to scan certain parts separate on purpose and then align them later. Um, so these are really the three steps that all the different techniques that I just showed have in common. Um, all right, so what, you know, now I wanna show you some interesting examples. Um, and there is, you know, a lot, a lot of uh, different kind of scanning projects out there. And I thought a little bit about how to group them in a way that makes sense for us. So I kind of create four sort of subgroups or categories uh, uh, that go between, uh, you know, preservation projects, sort of commercial projects, uh, uh, art projects, and then narrative, which is sort of museum and display projects. Um, these categories are by no means uh, strict or a lot of the projects are hybrid projects, which is something that's very interesting about scanning. So. Um, you know, if, if a project is in a particular category, don't take it as like, oh, that's only an art project that's not also preservation. Most of them are kind of crossovers, but, um, you know, because there were so many, I thought it was helpful to kind of have, uh, have groupings and kind of think of them as sort of different avenues of thinking about scanning and how they can become useful for you um, uh, as an architect and, and, and you know, as a, as a sort of practitioner and student. So, uh, and then, you know, again, in, in my classification uh, uh, obsession, I thought a little bit about, you know, uh, what are the different sort of 
axes or different ways to kind of visualize these different practices. And this is really just just the people that I've included in this presentation. So it's like a very uncomprehensive uh, uh, diagram. And it also only shows, so and I'm referring to their particular names. I'm not referring to their body of work overall. I'm referring to the specific scanning projects that they have made that I'm, that I'm showing here in the presentation. So this is more like a meta-analysis of, uh, of, of, of how um, different practices in scanning work. And uh, I think one of the main um, kind of axes is between a sort of preservation um, and scientific approach. Um, and then another one, which is a little bit more visual or interpretive um, or artistic, if you, if you will. So, uh, and, 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 you know, there's, there's a huge range between these two. Um, most of them have an aspect of both. Um, and then the other thing is, is scale, right? So the fluid parts go from, from very small to very, very large. Um, so that's just another another way to think through that. Um, so I'll, I'll be talking about these four different uh, chapters now. And again, it's not so much about specific order, just to, just, just a framework. Um, so the first one uh, uh, I want to mention is uh, the scan for, oh, and now I'm covering my own text here a little bit. Let me just move that down. Um, I hope it will, okay. Um, so this is um, a very contested monument, um, the Robert E. Monument in, in Richmond, Virginia, which got, um, you know, uh, you could, I don't know what the right word is, I guess, decorated, painted on, um, uh, uh, you know, written on, just, just there was like a manifestation of the Black Lives Matter movement on that monument. And um, SOA Studio is, uh, so Special Operations Executives um, uh, Studio is, uh, they're actually GSAP grads um, from the preservation program and they've done a lot of really interesting scanning projects. Again, the websites of these people are linked to the images. So if you wanna know more, just, just, just hit that link. Um, but this project to me, it stands out because it sort of makes a statement about you know, what is worth preserving and what is worth scanning. So they're essentially saying that this moment of this monument being, uh, 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 you know, contested is something that is worth preserving as a, as a historic preservation studio and, and to create, to go through effort to scan it and create images of it and publish it. Um, just for background information, basically, this is a Confederate uh, monument that, you know, was basically, uh, uh, I mean, basically, the Black Lives Matter movement proposed for it to be taken down, and then it was already about it, like uh, that was approved. And at the moment, it's still contested, so it still hasn't been taken down. So it's sort of an ongoing political debate, and kind of shows to me how just a simple act of recording something or scanning something can, uh, uh, you know, can be a political act just by saying this is important and this moment of this object in time with the way it's being changed through recent historic events is something that, that you know, we're, we're fully preserving in, in 3D. Um, oops, I think it's, oh no, okay. Uh, here, another example, um, uh, anybody think for a second what it is, if, if anybody recommends it, I'll tell you in, in, in two seconds. So there's another, another uh, preservation project that um, was done by Andrew Tallon, a uh, uh, you know, historian and uh, um, also sort of scanning uh, professional essentially. And he, he, he kind of did this with Grant as a one-man show and he scanned this entire church, I'm giving it away now, um, church in Paris. <laughs> By now we should probably have an idea. So it is Notre Dame in Paris. And um, as you know, I think last year or was it two years ago, Notre Dame burned down. And all of a sudden this scan that he made only like a few years prior um, was unearthed. And suddenly everyone was so grateful that this existed because essentially, you know, it allowed for, for a, well, if not a reconstruction, at least a very precise recording of what that of how the church looked like before it burned. Um, you know, reconstruction is a bit of a different topic, like should be reconstructed or not. But no matter where your position is on that, I think the fact that this has been scanned and we have very, very precise 
um, uh, data on how it looked is very valuable for, for such an important historic monument. Um, and then here, so this is a, a project by SciArc. So they're really like the, the main, um, you know, firm that works in, uh, or kind of like the, one of the most prominent firms that, that does large scale preservation projects around the world. Um, when you go on their website, they really have um, an impressive range of projects um, and they've been doing that work for, I think, 15 years or 20 years almost. So it's, they're kind of like the establishment in 3D scanning. Um, so they also get hired by, you know, governments to build and scan, um, uh, you know, all kinds of historical artifacts uh, around the world. This is uh, in Mexico City, the Metropolitan Cathedral, and also, you know, here this was scanned because there was an earthquake in 2017, and then in 2018 they wanted to scan it just to make sure that they have as much data as possible, at least from the state that it was in, but you see that already on the roofs and there's been damage, damage done to this, but sometimes that's also what happens uh, you know, when there is a certain awareness, uh, or the awareness kind of emerges once there's like an accident, once once something goes wrong, and then they realize, okay, this is something we have to preserve and make sure that we have um, continued access to these um, historic objects. So here's a scan of the interior. So this looks like a photo, and this is something when it gets quite interesting. So, you know, when you, 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 you can actually uh, move around in the space. And they also have a very good VR integration. So, you know, when you are, um, if you have a VR headset, you can literally just walk into the spaces in VR, which is very immersive and, and very, very impressive. Um, and, oh, I should mention that this was done with a combination of laser scanning and photogrammetry. So a lot of these large scale projects are actually combined techniques. Um, because laser scanning is really, really good at sort of getting general geometry and photogrammetry is really, really good at getting texture maps and getting all the details of, you know, uh, uh, color and reflection and so on. So this image is definitely a combination of both. Um, another, you know, big preservation project that is a little smaller in scale is the British Museum has started to scan their entire collection. And that's interesting because museum preservation was always very focused or, or archiving that it was very focused on um, you know uh, taking photos and writing descriptions and writing sort of all this meta information about objects like how heavy is it and and so on i used to work in a museum so i'm very familiar with the very very clumsy interfaces that 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 have been set up and that's because museums well have huge collections and you know it takes a long time to archive all this so at this point in time, most museums have some kind of on, like not necessarily online, but some kind of collection system where things are digitized, right? Some of them are local, but at least they know or they can kind of quantify what their collection is and have that, um, have that in kind of virtual space. But now that they finish that, it's like the next challenge they have to actually scan all their collections. So it's like a never ending project of archiving. Um, I mean, they don't have to, and, and not, there's actually not that many museums doing it yet just because it's like, can imagine it's a big project and big uh, investment, time investment. But the British Museum has done it and is also putting it online. And that becomes, you know, we're talking about accessibility in intro this year. So that, that's when uh, 3D scanning really becomes also about access where, you know, people who maybe wouldn't be going to the museum uh, because of physical barriers or other, other reasons are able to access these online and, and really look at them in, in 3D. Um, and I think now during Corona, maybe this has become even more uh, relevant or, or acutely um, felt by, by people who usually can go, right? Because they, they, that's the only way to access museums. Um, there's also an open source version of that where basically Recre is a project that uh, essentially was born out of a kind of terror or, or, or a sort of um, fear of losing cultural artifacts. Um, not just fear, I mean, it's real that, they, that, you know, cultural artifacts are lost every day through natural catastrophes, through uh, uh, also willful destruction. Um, it, you know, it's a terrorist activity to destroy cultural artifacts. So this project took the idea that, well, people, actually everybody can take photos, right? So we, we can just create a crowdsource, but, but 
a database where people can upload photos of artifacts and then other people who have access to the technology can uh, can create scans of it so it would become kind of like a global archive of um, important cultural artifacts. Um, and here's an example of one object that got reconstructed that way. So um, the lion of Mosul was, um, you know, a, uh, a very valuable artifact that was destroyed by ISIS uh, in the Iraq War in 2003, I think. And uh, basically, there was no no documentation for it except for, for photos that have been taken before by visitors and. Uh, you know, very limited archive. And so uh, this group kind of reconstructed and then on the right you see how they put it into a virtual museum. So now it's sort of like an online version and there was also a 3D printed version of that. Um, and there is also, you know, a uh, critique of that approach. So um, uh, there's this artist called Marshi Nalahari and I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but um, she's essentially uh, you know, working on on a, on a similar project in terms of like this, uh, in terms of scanning or sort of uh, recreating objects that have been destroyed by ISIS. But she's um, she's sort of taking a critical approach to it in terms of, and I included this quote here about how she's going about um, about that work. So she talks about how she spends a lot of time modeling these objects and how she really feels like she's taking care of them and, and, and sort of, you know, has like a very close relationship to, to these objects. Um, um, but also feels protective of them as cultural artifacts that have a long history. And so uh, I just want to read part of this code. When I say protect, I mean that I want to protect them not only from ISIS, but from Silicon Valley, from Google, from all the tech companies in the West, from all the white men and their colonial, colonialist technologies. So it's, it's, it's actually a direct critique of and there's a really great essay that I recommend reading that is linked, I think, on the second page here, um, where she talks about, you know, the, this idea of violent care. So on one hand, you know, uh, these big companies like Science and Google Arts and so on are coming in uh, to protect, but they're also doing that on their own terms and from their own lens and often uh, as a way of what she calls digital colonialism. So they kind of come in, they take the scans and then they take the scans back home to their own place to, you know, uh, to make sure that they're being, that they're safe. Um, so it's really important, I think for us, you know, th thinking about scanning, it's an important thing to, to see, to see this side um, and to kind of understand that nothing is neutral. Like, with, you know, I think we've talked about that in the social, in the, in the social media lecture and here it is, the scanning, scanning even seems a little bit more innocuous. It's sort of like, oh, well, you're just recording, right? But the act of recording is never neutral. You're always making a statement and you're always doing that um, as, you know, uh, a third body or third party that's, that's recording something, something else. Um, and uh, just another quote from the essay when she talks about the word align um, and, you know, we're literally the gram is or scanning is about aligning different uh, uh, data points. Remember the second point was alignment. The word align means to form in line, to fall into line, to adjust or form to align. It's about becoming one line, a straight line. So she's basically kind of saying that, you know, there's a certain conformity in terms of the way that the way that this kind of scanning process uh, works and the way that Western companies are coming in and and uh, making every, everything align according to their to their ideas. Um, so, so sort of like a flattening of history in terms of like, well, this is all cultural artifacts that belong to all of us. So we need to make them accessible. So similar, this idea of open source of cultural heritage, you know, um, I know that Google Arts is putting it out in terms of you can consume the content on the website, but the rights are still in the end with them. So she's kind of asking a question, what, what does it mean if all this data is with a one private company and you know how uh, uh, is that really is that really equitable and open or is that um, uh, also a form of colonialism in the end so um, <laughs> with that um, actually the next example is uh, you know talking about commercialism and school earth so Google earth is 
of all these examples that I'm showing, definitely the biggest one, uh, literally scanning the whole earth. Uh, and again, using photogrammetry uh, on the way to do that. So if, if you have never used Google Earth before, please do me a favor and just, just after this lecture spend, you know, no, not, you need more time. You take like a day off on the weekend and just like spend a whole day, day zooming around and it's so fun. Um, uh, it was my favorite quarantine activity when I couldn't go anywhere, which just to zoom around in Google Earth. Um, but again, this, this little technique we're talking about, this niche interest, right, is actually literally defining our whole world in terms of like understanding how we, how uh, in, in terms of three dimensionally mapping our world. And obviously before that, even the two dimensional mapping was also done through photogrammetry. So, uh, you know, just, just to kind of understand the scale at which this happens is I think really important. And here you see, so there's Google Earth VR, which is even more crazy. Um, and here you see sort of like a random castle uh, in, in VR that is just, you know, it's adding quite a lot of detail. So uh, again, um, this is very, so talking about that scale between preservation and not, and, 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 and you know, sort of uh, less scientific methods, I think this is an interesting in between because obviously it's a huge archive, but it's not necessarily, uh, primarily preservation or scientific minded. So um, its purpose is in the end because it's a private company is, you know, financial gain. So it's sort of like, an, but then on the way they are archiving and kind of creating all this, in, all this data, which again, you know, is problematic because maybe some, some people or, or countries don't actually want to give that data away, but they're using satellite to access that data and kind of like, not really, and the whole the whole goal is to scan everything, to scan the whole world in as much detail as possible. I mean, that's Google's project in general, right? So, so you know, here kind of 3D scanning takes a potentially dark turn, where because they're not necessarily asking for permission, but just assuming that it's okay to scan everything they want. So again, uh, you know, a contentious and interesting uh, topic in terms of like how far how far can you go. Um, you know, there's other companies, this is just an example, there's lots of sort of like more commercial companies, uh, more specifically to large scale construction. So these people, what they're doing is kind of site surveying. If you ever work on like a really large scale kind of urban, urban scale project, you might be working with something like that. So they're using drones and you see the pattern here. So these are drones, this is all sort of a drone taking a photo in very irregular intervals. Um, and they're basically scanning the site every few days or every day just to kind of map changes. So um, and it seems like a lot of effort, but it's the most effective way to actually map changes across a large site over time. So, you know, in the past they would maybe build things like that and it would be hard to kind of know exactly what was happening with such big masses of land. And so this is, this is kind of like what they're specializing in also using, using uh, photogrammetry mostly here actually. Um, another commercial application is actually in fashion. So um, this is an old project, probably like 10, 15 years ago from Nerve Systems, taking this idea that, you know, you could scan different body shapes and then adapt specific clothes to that body shape. Um, and it's something that uh, is sort of, I feel like it seems like a very viable idea, but it hasn't really been fully implemented yet in fashion. Maybe now with Corona, it's actually going to happen, but the, you know, people still kind of, I guess there's, there's, there's sort of this, people still want to go and try things on. And, and I think there's maybe also a certain uh, um, kind of hesitation about scanning yourself, right? Cause like, we don't, I don't know, it might be about data protection, but as, a, as an idea, you know, it basically would work as like a perfectly customized dress for you. And there's a really young company now working with that similar, those, those are some images for a, customized bra so the idea that you would like scan yourself and then get like the perfectly perfect fit bra so and this is only from this last year so just to say that these ideas keep popping up and you know eventually we'll we'll see how they get um how they get actually um let's say how popular they get or how if scanning is ever going to be that thing that everyone's just doing at home uh i think so but you know you never know you never know how how these technolo which technologies get adapted and become become so easy to use that everyone just um, accepts them. Okay, so some examples from the art world. There's actually been in the last few years, a lot of people investigating ideas about scanning and you know topics of preservation. And 
uh, Oliver Larich is a really interesting German artist who essentially kind of convinced museums that to go in there and scan their artifacts and then put them online on his website as open resources. So his project is sort of like on one hand, he recreates his own, he creates his own recreations. You see these, these uh, here and then here's another example, sort of like playing with the materiality. You know, you, you can see that that was a marble sculpture that is now kind of deconstructed through different materiality, giving it sort of like a different contemporary aesthetic. But the other part, maybe the, the you know, even more interesting part is how he, he just puts OBJs online and he uh, um, essentially, I, I listened to a lecture when he was talking about how he kind of sees these same 3D models in totally random, uh, you know, billboards or music videos or just people are using these 3D assets on the internet. And because he's making it totally openly available, uh, it, it ends up in quite unexpected places. So, you know, if you want to scan something and put it out there, um, there's definitely kind of like a, a community of people who are just downloading assets and reusing it. And actually architects do that very much as well, right? We, I mean, uh, I don't know if you have gotten into that yet, but there's so much 3D stuff online and, um, uh, you know, there's, there's endless websites with 3D models that are free or very cheap. So um, it's, it's something that I find quite fascinating, especially, I mean, a lot of it is 3D models but uh, some of it are also 3D scans and he was really actively doing it with scans and he also got into legal trouble doing it because the um, um, you know, museums, I think, I don't know if it was like super clarified that he was gonna actually publish those online. So that's when you get into the question of copyright, like how, um, you know, if you scan something and, uh, you know, again, like similar question to the digital colonialism, like who owns that data, like, is it, um, is it something you can just use for your own project? You need to ask permission. Um, yeah, these questions all, all become relevant. Here are the artists, New York-based artists working with scanning, Sophie Kahn. So she works, as you can see, with the glitch and the kind of expressive power of the glitch. And, you know, when you will create your replica, your, your, uh, your scans of your uh, uh, prototype, um, you know, you might also get glitches and you might choose to, um, actually use them as a strategic tool to make part of your designs. Um, obviously this is a slippery slope and but I think in her case, um, you know, you can you can see that the very intentional use of these errors or mistakes is kind of like using it as sort of expressive uh, potential. And those are actually uh, this project is called the death mask. So I think they were actually cast of uh, that people are not wrong and, and sort of you know memorize, memorizing um, the face of somebody through that through that technique. And she's been doing really interesting projects, kind of pushing scanning to the limit. So she did recently an event where people were moving and she was scanning them while they're moving again, sort of like almost like trying to produce glitches, right? It's not it's sort of kind of this artistic interpretation, I guess, where you're taking uh, uh, and architects do that too very much, right? Like we take a technique that's meant to do a certain thing and we subvert it to create a different kind of effect. Um, and uh, that's something I you know, encourage everyone to try and be aware of when you're scanning stuff. Here's a project um, by Claire Hentker. So uh, also New York based artist actually. We're here in a hotspot of <laughs> 3D scanning. Um, and she did this absolutely fascinating project where she went into malls so uh, abandoned malls across America. Sorry, let me correct this. She didn't actually go there. She found the videos of these malls on YouTube and then ran the videos through photogrammetry software and created this very eerie images and videos kind of like floating through, uh, uh, through these abandoned mall uh, photogrammetry sets. And uh, sort of like, you know, a very long video it takes like a few I, I don't know, hours, but definitely, you know, an hour or so, and it's sort of psychedelic because it's, you can definitely recognize a lot of elements, but because these videos that she's using were not meant, they're, they, were, they were just people who went, you know, I guess um, uh, in there just to kind of like scope them out and, and look at them. Uh, so they were not meant for, for, for photogrammetry, so they kind of, uh, you know, obscure and, and, and sort of hide a lot of information that usually you would try to capture um, but because these spaces are so derelict, it sort of fits 
with the general mood of the space. And she did the same thing with the movie The Shining. And that's something crazy when you think about it. Basically any movie in history, you could use, you could, you know, run it through photogrammetry software and you would essentially get like a 3D model of that, of the scenes in that movie. Um, obviously it works really well with The Shining because it keeps, you know, the movie is all about one building. And so, so there's lots of different scenes happening over and over again in the same spaces. But, you know, you can imagine that this model is extremely distorted, um, uh, but still in some corners and aspects actually quite accurate. So it's sort of like, uh, again, it's this very uncanny 3D model talking about this, <laughs> this uh, uncanny movie. So it's, um, again, a very beautiful, you know, interpretation of using, using, using the glitches, using all the mistakes that happen as, uh, as a tool of expression. Um, yeah. Um, and the final art project is Adrián de la Rojas, uh, an Argentinian artist who, uh, I think at this point, four, year, four or five years ago, uh, did a summer rooftop installation at the Metropolitan Museum. And to do that, he scanned uh, objects from the collection and he also scanned people. So here you see a vase that, you know, is some kind of some part of the Met collection. And this is an actual person that he scanned. Uh, I think this might have been a GSEP student because I was, I was, I was recruiting people to be scanned and I think she, she ended up being scanned. Um, but the point is that, you know, his work sort of brought together things that could never actually physically touch. So suddenly in this sculpture and then made it into another sculpture that you couldn't touch. That was the irony, I guess, when you came up there, there were guards and people obviously wanted to touch these things because they were, so this was a whole kind of like uh, installation of like six, seven of these tables on the whole rooftop. Uh, and people wanted to touch these sculptures and, and you know, you are not allowed to, but at least in the physical uh, manifestation of this sculpture, these things could, could be touched. Um, yeah. All right. Um, so the next chapter of projects are kind of in between or hard to define. I mean, they often, they would also, they could also fall into the, I think the art chapter and the narrative chapter are very overlapping or maybe, maybe could be the same one, I'm not sure. But this one is a, um, a project by the, an architect actually by Sam Jacob, uh, a London based architect. And he, He's actually written and thought about a lot about scanning and copying and, and, and you know, ideas of reproduction. Um, so there's some interesting essays there to be found there, but uh, this was a part of an exhibition that was at the Venice Biennale in 2016 that was put on by the Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, and the whole exhibition was dedicated to scanning and replicas, which, you know, uh, was obviously for me really fascinating that that this topic that felt always very niche suddenly was on center stage. And there were, you know, a series of scans and ways of basically, you know, museum approaches to scanning kind of related to things we've seen. But his project was actually to scan a refugee shelter um, and then rebuild it on site or kind of like, you know, have kind of a cast of it. Yeah. I'm not gonna comment on like, you know, it's, a, it, it's just another, another interesting, project that you know I think exists at, at, at sort of the boundary between documentation, art, uh, it really is it really is somewhere somewhere right in, right in between uh, uh, and critical theory all, all combined. Um, here another uh, uh, example so it was the Learn School Video Network designed an exhibition at the Met um, called, uh, about Charles James, a fashion designer who created this very volumetric dresses and they were trying to kind of uncover what was behind the structure of these dresses because you know they, they these dresses have a lot of hidden pockets and ways of, of sort of being built that is um, really not apparent when you just look at the dress so they created this uh 3d models of the of the dresses and had all these animations playing um kind of uncovering how the dresses work from the inside here you see like a lot of layering going on, but then they also did um, a set of, of x-rays. And x-rays, I'm only touching on that here, and that's also why I'm including the examples. X-rays are not really scan. I mean, they're adjacent, scanning adjacent, and they're, you know, you could say they're a form of scanning, 
um, but not really the main the main topic here. But I think it's an interesting approach also, you know, towards the scanning through something or not just not just scanning the surface, but actually kind of uh, showing the, the hidden structure and the hidden the hidden um, yeah the hidden materials that are behind the dress or the hidden infrastructure. Um, and finally, another sort of project that's hard to place um, in, a, in a, you know, in a most interesting way in a, in a, uh, is E.L. Weizmann's project. So uh, he um, is also, you know, an architect, but kind of works sort of at the, at the intersection of a few different fields. And uh, this is actually a scan of a former concentration camp in Belgrade that later got turned into a sort of Roma um, housing project. And the proposal was to make that, to turn that into a museum. And he essentially used scanning as an argument to kind of like show the history of the site um, and to basically argue against the museum because it would again sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, essentially create uh, or, or sort of the people who, who then found the home there, they would have to leave. So it, it would it would sort of create another form of injustice towards a, a, a minority or an underserved group. And so it, yeah, I think these are, you know, Weizmann's work in general with scanning is super interesting and highly political and um, and also also very interesting in terms of representation. So here you can see, um, you know, how he sort of is drawing this out this hidden structures underneath the main building through heat maps and kind of uh, showing sort of like a, a mixture between a scan and an x-ray and, and different modes of representation kind of all combined and collapsed into one. All right, um, I just have to open the door because it's getting way hot in the office. <laughs> okay, this is better. If you see me overheating, that's because <laughs> my, um, my, my, my the little meeting room got really warm. All right, so I know this has been a lot of references and projects, but I want to talk briefly about some work that I've been doing at GSAP and some kind of like personal scanning projects uh, that I've been working on in the past few years. Uh, and then we'll get into uh, into the technology, just through a very brief technology. So uh, I kind of came across scanning, you know, really, uh, I would say by accident, but it wasn't this really like that I that I wanted to become a, the scanning person, but it sort of grew over time as an as an interest, and actually a lot of it got developed also uh, at, at GSA because we were doing uh, and also working at the Met, kind of working with artifacts and sort of thinking about how to represent artifacts, existing artifacts in virtual space. So the kind of that translation between sort of the physical and digital always. Uh, was incredibly fascinating to me. And so uh, here I'm showing a few seminars that, um, uh, or work from seminars that I've been working on in the past few years. So this was in last spring 2019 uh, with a group of students. We went to the Intrepid, which is uh, an aircraft carrier on Manhattan's west side. And we were allowed to have, or able to have access to the sick bay, which is a usually inaccessible space. Um, so it's sort of like, um, um, you know, uh, the, the build, so the building, the ship is, sorry, it's not a building, the ship is a museum these days. Um, but the, um, uh, uh, so most of it is accessible, but then there's basically a, a few floors that are kind of like too hard to reach because there's this really narrow stairs. And so the museum was interested in sort of thinking about how we could display these spaces that people can't go inside. So we went down there and photographed it and rebuilt them in 3D and created sort of like a web app that allowed people to kind of, you know, in 3D go in and explore those things. Um, and here you see some of the scans that students made. And this was, you know, also really hard spaces to scan with very uneven lighting. So the results were really, really quite fascinating. Yeah, examples. And the students were to develop uh, apps and a bunch of sort of different um, uh, sort of prototypes that help to experience the space and uh, the final review actually took place on the ship uh, with you know a bunch of staff and, and different reviewers coming in and sort of uh, enjoying or sort of enjoying I mean it's, it's, it's actually a pretty 
heavy dark history but sort of like being able to kind of access these spaces uh, uh, through sort of virtual narratives but still being on the ship and stuff and then we were all able to actually go into the space it was funny all right so this was a more uh, recent project so that happened just this spring and I mentioned that the school has a laser scanner so this was actually scan a laser, laser scanner scan of an abandoned pub in uh, downtown um, downtown New York. So this was a space that um, uh, basically I'm I'm part of a gallery collective and we're doing exhibitions in abandoned retail spaces. So uh, this was our site at the time and so with the students we went in and scanned that whole space. Um, and we used both laser scanning and photogrammetry on it um, and create, you know, the whole plan was really to create uh, projects around that and then it was basically, we managed to get that scan and Corona happened, so it sort of, didn't, you know, couldn't really finish the project, unfortunately. This is the space, you, uh, just a photo of the space itself. And here you see some, some uh, detailed scans of the space, um, uh, how they were, yeah, um, kind of like capturing the kind of uh, details of the surfaces uh, uh, of that abandoned pub. So it's like really, really looking closely at things. Um, and that seminar kind of pivoted in the end, uh, you know, and again, the flexibility for the grammatry helped here because everyone had to be at home. So we ended up working on uh, everyone's scanned their interior. And here you see some of these examples um, where people you know, chose an aspect of the quarantine and displayed it through this three-dimensional scan. So if most people, it was like a living room or a bedroom. Um, and we made the scans and then uploaded it to the web, but also included animation and sound. Um, so again, the link is on the, um, on the presentation, so you can go check it out and, you know, uh, maybe get, get, get an idea of what, what we were doing because it's sort of, these little, they're basically little 3D scenes that allow for, for narrative. So this was a student project um, uh, that essentially talked about, the, you know, the student having to move out of the dorms in, in, um, in uh, Morningside Heights. And then, so he had to kind of pack up everything uh, and move to his new place. And this is sort of all his belongings kind of, uh, visualized in this and kind of documented again in, uh, in this three-dimensional way. And, you know, of course I'm dreaming that one day some researchers will find this incredibly useful, the fact that we've <laughs> archived these specific moments uh, in, in, in 3D. So we'll see, we'll see if that, uh, at least for right now, uh, at first, like I say, it was therapeutic. It kind of helped people to, you know, work through the, there was basically nothing else people could think about. So we kind of, change the projects to, to be working with that. Um, and here, a, a project I've been working on since last December with a friend from Argentina. Um, we, so she's doing her PhD, uh, working on these abandoned slaughterhouses in the Argentinian Pampas uh, by the architect Francisco Salamone. Um, he built all these structures, around 30 of them in um, throughout uh, the at 1930s in 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 um, in a very short amount of time, and they're kind of like you know disregarded by architecture history of say, or people generally are not aware of them, and they're also I mean they're quite famous in Argentina actually, and people go travel and see them, but there's very little documentation on them. So we went down there. She's writing her PhD thesis uh, on the topic of sort of meat production in Argentina and 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 slaughtering and architecture kind of plays uh, a sort of part of that in terms of like you see this sort of symbolic uh, uh, buildings that are kind of like proudly pronouncing you know that they're mataderos they're slaughterhouses which is sort of you know unheard of I would say in in, in most of most slaughterhouses are kind of trying to at very con conceal their function or just be unobtrusive and not necessarily announcing what they're doing so it's kind of a very interesting uh, typology in terms of like a slaughterhouse as a building that um, is you know, articulating that architecturally. So what we uh, did is, you know, went down there and visited all most of them, or the ones that we could, not all of them are accessible. 
um, and I just use you know phot photogrammetry without any special techniques, and I think that's important. So I really just used a good camera and took all these scans. And here you see uh, what, so you can also see that some of the information is missing, right? Because I didn't have a drone, I don't really have the information of this building from above. So you know, of course, there's limitations, but I still think that. When you go on your next trip uh, at some point in 2022, <laughs> 21, let's say, uh, you and you um, you want to, you know, you see something really fascinating, you can just document it, and it's almost like a different way of doing photography. It's like a more, obviously, a little bit more involved, but it's sort of, uh, you know, if I would have just taken a photo, I would probably not remember these buildings very clearly. But the fact that I walked around in them and spent a little bit more time and photographed them in detail and then spent time processing brought them much closer to me as objects. Uh, kind of, you know, leaning back to this idea of you, you, you spend time with a model, a 3D model, and you, you start to kind of have affection for it, or you start to kind of like love, love the object and take care of it. It's sort of like virtual caretaking. <laughs> um, and so, and we're, we're working on a website to publish these projects. So, um, you know, we'll be publishing uh, the 3D models and sort of text that she has written. So that's an ongoing project at the moment, but those are just progress screenshots. Uh, and here you see we found uh, a plan of the Matadero and then here so the kind of reddish lines are, are the scan of the outer shell of the building and then here you see so this is just a rhino screenshot by the way a little, little you know behind the curtain trick so but sort of use, using sort of different uh, overlays and here you see the scan of the interior with the tracks um, on the ceiling of the building. So really getting quite a lot of detail out of these scans. Um, and, you know, side note, it's kind of, kind of looks like, like a head, the head of a, of a cow. So, <laughs> which was also fascinating when we found out, you know, this, this slaughterhouses actually have like this animalistic shape to them in plan, which we didn't really see before. All right, I know that I'm already at an hour, so I'll keep, the history super short, I promise. And I, I know this was a lot of references and I hope that you, you know, found some things really interesting and inspiring um, and, and, uh, and can dive deeper when you, when, you, um, when you hit the links. So, you know, to talk about photogrammetry, I mean, as you've seen, it's applied in so many different ways. We really have to talk about the history of perspective. Um, but photogrammetry in the way that we understand it now in terms of um, you know, what I talked earlier, where aligning or sort of understanding where three-dimensional point is based on, on two-dimensional points. It's really something that only kind of emerged in the late 18th century. So here you have uh, the German, a beautiful illustration by the German mathematician Guido Hauck. Um, and he, you know, sort of was the first one to kind of postulate that if an object has been photographed on three plates exposed from different stations, any one of these photographic perspectives may be evolved graphically from the remaining two. So just sort of establishing this relationship uh, uh, that you can, you can essentially pro projective geometry on a pretty advanced level. And just, you know, I mean, the, the main driver, the main sort of like uh, economic or sort of, uh, uh, let's say, the main, the main motivation to develop these techniques became very soon this idea of topographic mapping. So um, if you, if, and you have to imagine that before 1900, only 26% of America was topographically mapped. That means, I mean, there was a flat map, but people didn't really know how high things were um, uh, and you know what, what the elevation was of, 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 of the landscape, which is quite crazy for us to think about, right? Like we, we take it for granted that we know we know we can we can measure the land so that was a really big uh, uh, sort of reason to develop photogrammetry as a technique um, and the first phase when they first started really seriously mapping the land it's called plane table photo photogrammetry and just called plane table because there was basically just flat tables that you would take out onto the field you know people didn't really that this is like 1850s uh, when, when, when that started to be used very seriously. Um, and that was before commercial air flight or air flight in general was really uh, feasible. And so, you know, they had to rely basically on, on sort of physical um, measuring on going really like 
basically surveying the land with these tables um, on, out on the site. Um, so, you know, ar around 1850 was like a crucial time where you could say photogrammetry as we know it really started. And the Frenchman Emile of Sedat was really the first one to use um, photographs for topographic map computation. So, you know, there's all these people, I feel like there's a lot of different sort of stages to photogrammetry. It's really hard to say, okay, this is when it started, but he at least, you know, has that claim or that title of like father of photogrammetry. And you see that one of the earliest things that he measured was actually a building. And here you see some topographic maps as well. Um, and then the German uh, uh, mathematician Maidenbauer, he, well, you know, that's where um, it gets confusing, but he was then uh, supposed to be the first inventor of architectural photo photogrammetry, even though Lasseda had done it, uh, I guess almost, no, actually a little bit earlier. So this was 49 and he was in 58. So here you see uh, a German cathedral that he measured, you know, through the techniques of photogrammetry in a precise way. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, because there were no airplanes, people found different ways to go up into the air. So one of the first, the earliest ways of uh, essentially, you know, creating topographic maps was through air balloons. So there's this guy Natter, he was um, actually an artist and cartoonist, uh, but then got really into photography and then ended up sort of being the first person to really take photos from, uh, from an aerial perspective. And you see how physically involved that was again, sort of like getting up there. I love this picture of him in this little basket, just <laughs> getting raised up uh, in the balloon to, to take photos. Um, you know, kind of closely, close, closely after, um, towards the end of the 18th century, the, in the US, James Fairman uh, was sort of advancing uh, photogrammetry and he, he also, this was also based still on the hot air balloon, uh, on taking photos from hot air balloons, but he invented a specific kind of camera that would allow to take better pictures from up there. So, you know, photogrammetry as we know it now in terms of large map making really depended on two developments, which is like the development of cameras and the development of air flight. And so you can see, you know, throughout that time, how these two things had to come, they had to come together to really allow for large scale mapping. Um, so around 1900, we kind of enter uh, the time of analog photogrammetry. So that's when, you know, photography became widely available um, and sort of air flight also increasingly, uh, increasingly became available. And also there was, you know, beginning of the 20th century, essentially First World War and then Second World War, it became more and more important to map territories, um, uh, not least also for colonial purposes. So this is actually a German uh, autocartograph. So this, this devices became more and more uh, complicated and, and, and sophisticated in terms of like mapping, uh, ma ma mapping mechanisms, literally machines. Um, so this is already 1971, we know fairly, I mean, not that long ago, uh, essentially. Uh, here you see um, this this pretty intense machine, the aero cartograph, uh, you know, helping to scan the Hoover Dam in preparation to build, um, to build the dam. And uh, in in the U.S. again, so you know, I think what's important to know is that photogrammetry wasn't invented by like one person at some time, but it was really like a slow development that kind of was an international collaboration, not collaboration. I think it was more like competition, but you know, basically different countries sort of like made progress on that in, at different times and. Uh, uh, kind of enabled what we have today. So uh, in, the, in the US, uh, Sherman Fairchild was sort of the first, I guess, photogrammetry entrepreneur. He created this custom camera and was also the first person to create this sort of like 3D composite of New York City, um, uh, you know, really, really like mapping, mapping the town. So after 1960, roughly, uh, we enter the stage of analytical photogrammetry and that's when we really got went large scale. So here you have Duan Brown, which is kind of like a pioneer of that time, of that era. And he, uh, again, you, you notice that almost each of these uh, inventors actually invented a new camera. So you see how, you know, photogrammetry innovation is almost always used, almost, it's kind of like goes 
hand in hand with the, with the innovation on cameras and sort of like specific techniques of how to use, you know, augment these existing techniques and, 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 and basically innovate on the camera itself and then therefore create better photography for photogrammetry. Um, and in that time, we started to go up into space, right, and really map, um, map the world through satellites. So suddenly it was possible to really uh, create super large scale mapping. So, you know, going, started off in the plane table on the ground, physically like measuring things, then went up in hot air balloon, then in an airplane, and now we're up in space. <laughs> Um, and then the last, you know, uh, phase, let's say, which we're in now is, or the current phase, I guess, is digital photogrammetry, and that's what we're using in COP. So uh, it's, it's really using the computing power uh, uh, of, you know, computers to, to help us enable these, to make these calculations. So you'll never have to actually calculate how photogrammetry really, really works yourself. You know, you just, you record the data, you bring it in, and the computer essentially runs it for you. All right, so bear with me for about 10 more minutes uh, in terms of, you know, thinking about uh, or kind of understanding the basic principles of, um, of how photogrammetry works for you. So I mentioned bef before sort of these three steps that every scanning process has to go through in photogrammetry. Specifically, this is how these three steps work. So you have you know, the first step, the collecting data part is when you're taking photos, quite simply. And there's some instructions on how to do that. But there's generally two big options. Um, the first one is you're using your phone camera, simplest one. Um, if you want higher resolution details, you know, using a professional camera is definitely better. Um, the second uh, step is then to process these photos and to create mesh models out of these photos. So this is, uh, remember the, the kind of alignment phase where every, everything comes, uh, comes together. So um, for this, there's two softwares that I recommend. There's lots of different software out there, but the main one that we're going to be using in class is Reality Capture. Um, and it's really, you know, I guess the state of the art software right now. Um, it has uh, a kind of paper input model, so you're, you can use it and practice on it for free, and then you only pay for export. Um, 3DF Sapphire is also a really good software, um, kind of similar, similar to Reality Capture in many ways. So, you know, it's just it's a, a bit of a matter of preference, but you can also try that, and I think it's free up to 50 photos. You can actually process it for free in there. And then there's a ton of different apps on your phone. I've tried a lot of them. They're okay. You know, they're not, I mean, if you really want to just test something really quick and you want to play with it, go ahead, definitely. And also there's some iPhones and Android different apps. Um, but, you know, if it's something you want to do, want to use, you want to export meshes, you want to use it for an architecture project in some way, either as a site survey or as a, you know, part of your design in some capacity, I really recommend going through either reality capture or 3 f Sapphire. Um, finally, uh, you know, then once you have the mesh, there's like the third step, which is editing meshes. So here you, um, you, you, you basically have to kind of be very careful about mesh density and, uh, you know, how, how heavy your files are. Uh, if you want to 3D print your mesh, then it can be quite dense because, you know, you probably want quite a lot of detail in it, but not too much because then the file will crash. Uh, if you're using it for uh, uploading it to the web, you want it to be super, super light and work with texture maps to kind of create detail and so on. There's a lot, lot of new ones on there, um, but the point is there's basically a whole different array of software you can be using in that last step. Mesh Mixer is a really good one. Uh, it helps you to kind of process meshes. Um, it, you know, has kind of like a sculpting tool where you can make corrections um, and, and so on. 3D Max is also very good. You know, it's a classic mesh modeler, so it allows you to kind of like edit vertices, delete stuff and so on. Blender is free and also a very good software. And then Rhino is actually probably the least ideal one, um, but, you know, it often ends up being the last step because at least in my workflow, Rhino kind of like is, is at the end because I use Rhino for a lot of other things. So if I combine a mesh model in the end, it, it ends up in Rhino at the end, but it's actually not really the best software for editing meshes, just 
just I'll just say that in a general way and we can we can talk later about like the details of why. Um, here just one more time, uh, you know, this idea of like aligning different points, just something to remember while you're actually scanning while you're doing it. So um, because so here we have the, the three holy rules of scanning, right? When you're doing, when you start taking your photos, what do you have to think about? The first number one rule is you have to have lots and lots of overlap. So, um, you know, because if you don't have overlap between the images, so if you, if you take an image from this angle and one from the other angle, it just won't, the software will not be able to align these two images um, to find the third point. So you have to always make sure there's lots of overlap and the recommendation for overlap is around 60%. So it's kind of like when you're shooting a panorama, you know, you kind of, you, you want to go along an axis and you want to sort of move slowly. So it's the same way with photogrammetry, but you just take like a photo um, every, every step of the way. The second rule is, you know, take good pictures. I guess that one's a little obvious, but if you have really blurry pictures, photogrammetry won't, won't work because it won't be able to align um, various points. So you wanna really be, you know, take that extra time and make sure your picture is sharp. Um, honestly, that is a bit less of a problem with phones um, because phones at this point, you know, are very good at focusing. Um, if you're working with like an analog camera or, or even a digital camera that's like a proper camera, uh, it can actually be a little bit harder. I mean, the final result will be better and sharper, but you have to kind of play around to make sure you have a sharp picture. And the third rule is you want to be working with still objects. So, you know, make sure that your object is secured. It's not gonna move in the wind or slide, you know, if you're, if you're scanning a person, it's quite tricky. You know, they have to be absolutely still or otherwise, again, the images won't be able to align uh, into a three-dimensional model. So uh, this one sounds simple, but it's actually sometimes harder to achieve than you think. Like you have to definitely make sure that your object is not moving. All right, so let's say you know all these rules, how do you go about it? So you essentially, let's say you have, you know, for most of you, this is the technique you'll be using when you have a prototype or some kind of like smaller object that you can walk around. Um, you're using something called convergent axis capture. It means mentally you kind of draw a central point of your object, kind of like a midpoint, and then you just walk around it in an even radius and you take photos at regular intervals. And it depends a bit on the size of the object, but for most of you, that distance will be one step away or two steps away because it's quite small. Um, and you can do that, ideally you do that two or three times at, at different heights. So you kind of start off at a very low height and then you go, you know, look at it slightly higher. You just want to make sure that in, when you're doing the circles, you kind of catch it from, from different angles. If you're scanning a room or kind of like a very longitudinal object, then you would be using the parallel axis capture. So in that case, you wouldn't just be walking in a circle, but you kind of walk in a line and you just keep taking these photos. Um, and then, you know, when you go around the curve, you want to you wanna still uh, make sure that you have enough overlap. So you never want to have like a sharp change between taking a photo from one side and then all of a sudden then moving over and taking it from the other. You kind of, so actually this is not ideal. You kind of want to like keep taking the photos all around if you want this to be one model. Here, so this is a, a slide from Special Operations, Operations Executive, so SRA Studio. And this is how they're planning out when they're scanning something, which is really, I think, you know, I guess for, 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 for a first scan, not really needed because you just do three circles, but when you're scanning something a little bit more complex, um, then, you know, you want to be kind of thinking about how you're gonna approach that object. So here they were scanning these really tall columns and they needed a lift to move them up and down. So they calculated, okay, we're gonna go you know, four times up from each side and we're gonna kind of take photos uh, uh, as we go up. And, you know, for them, because they're, they're doing it as a business, they also need that to kind of estimate the time. Uh, but even for you, if you do a more complex scanning project, just making a sketch of how you're going to approach it uh, is definitely a good idea. Um, all right, and I'll end with this image, this beautiful image, no, it's not, it's, it's, it's kind of like purposefully ugly, but just when you're doing your home setup, this is just an example of something you could do, right? Um, the most typical 
uh, error that I see people doing with photogrammetry is that they use a white background or a neutral background because we're used to, when we think of object photography, we always think that, oh, like in a studio portrait, right? You wanna have like something neutral in the background. When you're doing photogrammetry, you want to have the opposite. You want to have like a magazine on the ground or something super patterned, like a rug or something that has, you know, uh, color and texture and, and, and letters patterns because these things are the ones that help your, the software to align these images towards each other. Um, and then the other thing to notice about this, uh, the light is sort of diffuse. There's no direct sharp shadows. It was a cloudy day. I did it on the inside, but it was a cloudy day. So, you know, it got pretty even lighting. Uh, and then the object is actually really small on the whole picture. So I'm leaving a lot of space around the object just to make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm really, um, uh, that the image is in line. If I would just do a close up, I tried a version of this where it just went, went quite close and it didn't align. So these things that are around actually help the software to align it. So taking, you know, making sure your object only takes up maybe a third or less of your image is actually a good idea. Again, very counterintuitive to people. People always go close. You actually want to be further away because it's going to, it's going to help with registration. Registration is the process of aligning. And then the other thing, uh, this, uh, funny props I have here. I'm showing that because I know you'll, most of you will be scanning at home, right? So the setup might look ridiculous. Like you, uh, you was just using this spices I had at home to lift up the object so I can later just cut it out more easily. Um, and you know, all that stuff around, this is like a, a mushroom brick that I was growing. All that stuff around is, um, is irrelevant for the final product because you'll be cutting it out of the three scene. So it doesn't need to be pretty. It's really just, there to kind of help align your, your model. Um, yeah, and that's it for, for the lecture part. And I'm sorry, I went a little bit long. <laughs> um, do you guys want to turn on your video so I can see you and maybe ask some questions? So everyone now has the ability to unmute yourself. Um, and of course you can turn on your video as Vika suggested. Um, you know, it's a little hard to have a conversation feeling in isolation. Um, but uh, Vika, do you mind resharing your slides? Because a lot of people joined after you had already shared them. So that might be uh, yeah. um, just something like for the posterity of the of the folks still in the room. Oh yeah, because they, they only see it if they're already locked in. Okay, I just shared them again with everybody so you can access them and have access to the links as well. Yeah. If you have any thoughts or questions, you can enter into the chat or just join the conversation now. I'm sure there must be something. How, um, is there anything you, you liked or thought was interesting? You can also just post it in the chat if you don't want to talk in the, in the group. <laughs> it was a long lecture, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Nico? Yeah. Yeah, so hi. Uh, the lasers you showed earlier that are expensive when used during construction, do they only take measurements? They don't take imagery? It's like the distances. Wait, which, which ones? Sorry. The ones that people use in construction that you said they were very expensive. So um, you need to uh, have the um, uh, manager with you or something like that. The ones with a tripod on. The ones with the tripod. Let me find you the slider. I'm, I'm blanking. Which slider are you talking about? I'll find it. Line number four. Oh, at the very beginning. Yeah, the laser 3D scanners. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So they're, yeah, they're, they're not, I mean, they're taking measurements, but they're taking measurements in 3D. I'm going to close the door because somebody's speaking loudly here. Um, they're taking measurements, uh, they're, they're creating point out. So the results are actually very similar to photogrammetry uh, in terms of how they look like. And there's also, a plugin that takes this point cut straight into Revit. 
So you could, you know, use it as a site survey and scan like a whole large site and then kind of bring it into, into Revit, for example. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's not, I mean, yeah, it's all taking measurements, right? But it's taking measurements in this case, it's essentially like a, this device is sort of on the tripod and it rotates and it takes around eight minutes per rotation and creates like lots and lots of point clouds all around. And then you move it over a few meters or a few feet um, and then it does the same process again. So for that image that I showed on page, um, you know, of the, of the pub that we scanned with the students, page 45, that was taken using a laser scanner. And what you see is sort of, you know, a very dense point cloud that was the result of that scan. Uh, Michael, did you have a question? I saw your hand up. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a very practical question as and one of the intro students, but in terms of like getting a picture of our object um, and kind of propping it up, is there, do you have any advice for that? And, and like, could there be problems if it's kind of the way it touches the ground and that kind of thing? Yeah, I know that a lot of you have, um, you know, some kind of body armatures. So I would say if you have a mannequin, that would be ideal, but you can also create something. Some of my students have like just stuffed something in there to kind of, you know, like foam or something soft to kind of keep the shape. Um, or you could also ask somebody to model it for you. Um, uh, but then, you know, as I mentioned earlier, they have to be very still. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. But I would err on the side of, uh, you know, I, I think putting a person in is a little tricky because you'll always kind of see, the, it depends a little bit on the project, but I would say in most cases, it's probably better to keep it abstract because you want to probably use it in a slightly more abstract way in your next step. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, we have a question in the chat, which is, any good method to edit, simplify the output mesh? Yeah. Um, so essentially, the best way is to actually simplify it already early when you're doing the scan, because uh, specifically in reality capture, there's actually a simplify option. Um, and then the reason to do it early is because if you do it before creating the texture, then the texture will be optimized towards the kind of low resolution mesh, and it still will look really good. So if you have a very high resolution mesh with a high resolution texture and you export it, then, you know, and you downsample, downsample the mesh, then the texture might not look as good later. This is just, uh, yeah. But, and then the, the other options, if you already have a high resolution mesh exported and you haven't, you know, there's no way for you to access uh, the original file, mesh mixer is really the, probably the best software to reduce file size or to reduce mesh. Uh, output mesh size. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Um, I've seen some of them. They look kind of flat. Not not in the slides, but like his, uh, before. How do you make sure that your model doesn't look flat? Like the walls don't look flat and the objects in it. Is that because of the shadows, bad lighting, or? Oh, how to make sure the, the actual output, the 3D model doesn't look flat? No, like, let's say I scan a room and then there's a light switch or a painting. They usually blend in flat with the, within the wall. How do you mm -hmm. make sure they don't, they don't look like that? They actually look mm -hmm. like that. Um, it's all about lighting, really. Like if you have good lighting um, in a room, then, you know, it should really pick up everything. If you have... Um, if you have strong shadows, if you have an area that's completely white or completely black or just one color, then it's, it can be hard for the camera to, again, align stuff, right? When you, so for example, if you have a very, if you're trying to scan a very wide room, you have a gallery space that you want to scan, what you could do is you could add colorful dots on the walls just to help align the image and then cut them out later. So that's actually a technique that people do to kind of, uh, you know, deal with spaces that are not naturally have, that don't naturally have a lot of texture. Uh, the other thing is, so actually laser scans also, before you start laser scanning, you have to put 
this sort of printout of a certain pattern onto the walls, and that helps the laser scan to register and kind of spatially understand where those different points are. So, you know, it depends a little bit. It's it's very specific to each space, but in general, um, there's some hacks to make sure, even if you don't have ideal conditions. I mean, people have scanned, you know, dark caves and uh, over like it, it. It's sort of. I think there's there's a big big range of what you can scan, but it gets more and more nuanced. Uh, as you get more into it in terms of what the specific te technique for each space is. Which is also fun because each each thing you scan is going to be slightly different. You know, I feel like every time I scan something, I usually, even now, unless it's something very simple, I, I probably need like, you know, uh, one or two attempts to really figure it out. Thank you. Kevin, you look like you have a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there's one in the chat, but um, okay. I can go now. Or just, I guess, just real quick. Do you have any? And it's another practical question. But do you have any recommendations for scanning items that are not particularly solid? Like my machine is like a bunch of spindly, wiry things. There's a lot of like open space between objects, and every time I've tried so far, it like kind of comes through, but not super successful. I don't know if it's just my lighting or I'm not taking enough pictures or, or what the problem is. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, yeah, it's, it's, that's definitely tricky. There is a certain kind of objects that are simply better and easier to scan than others and having, uh, you know, generally like things like sculpture or things that I mean, there's a reason why the typical scan you see is sort of like a marble sculpture because it has like a solid surface, not too much reflection and lots of texture on it. So um, if you have, and I, I remember your project, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tricky one to scan. And I, I think in your case, what you could do is sort of uh, try and then also play with the, with the artifacts. But I think if, because you mostly have planes and sticks, there's also some projects where I'm like, okay, maybe scanning is not the right technique. You know, you could also just, just, uh, it's just, if you, if you have very rigid geometries, like lots of squares and lines, maybe it's, it, there's a different measurement technique that might be better. That said, um, you, there's still a, a scanned quite tricky things and it's the same rules as for everything else. So if you have, you know, uh, if you have like lots of patterns in the background, even like a skinny thing or skinny or very thin surface can come out quite nicely. So um, some of the scans that I've done in the fight arsenal, they were like thin paper thin sort of surfaces that came out and they worked out, but I think because the surroundings were extremely textured. So yeah, I would, I would try, you know, it's also quite a big, big object. So try to move away from it, make sure the whole object is in the frame Mm -hmm. And, you know, probably outside would be the best way to do it and, and pick a space, maybe throw a carpet underneath or something like that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Something with a lot of contrast to the objects so that the camera can kind of understand, um, you know, where your object starts and where it ends. Um, so Yipeng just followed up. Uh, is there any good method to turn the scan object? This can mesh to editable mesh, like quad mesh in Rhino. Oh yeah, mm, yeah. So in Mudbox, there is a good way, and um, it's called the re. It's called uh, retopologize tool. So you turn you know the triangular mesh into a quad mesh. Um, for those who are not familiar, triangular meshes are, you know, generally what comes out of a. Uh, of, a, of the scanning process. Uh, but quad meshes are the ones that are really good for editing in 3D Max and so on. The one thing about the retopology tool is it doesn't, so the, the texture map won't match anymore. So you have a clean model then, in terms of it being, you know, editable in Max or, and, and, and stuff like that, but, or ZBrush. But it's not, yeah, you'll have to kind of redo the texture or remap the texture. Um, ZBrush though actually can deal with triangles really well. So, you know, in most cases, actually the triangles can probably, you can work around it with triangles. 
but if you definitely need co op, then that's, that's the best tool I know. Um, cool. Uh, curious, you know, what do you guys think of sort of these questions of scanning as, um, I guess, preservation tool or, uh, you know, in terms of that data privacy? Uh, I thought, uh, I'm curious if anybody has, has thoughts on this. We can also continue the discussion later in class. I think it's been a long lecture too, so. Um, yeah, all right, let's do that. <laughs> Great. Um, cool. All right. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> See you guys.